Hi everybody, Jacob Reed here from ReviewEcon.com. Today we're going to be looking at the uh, 2022 Microeconomics Set 1 FRQs. They just got released today. This is an unboxing video, so that means I haven't uh, before today seen these questions. I don't work for the College Board, so I don't actually know what the rubrics are going to end up saying. Uh, but these are my best guesses. These were some tough questions. Uh, there were definitely some curveballs this year, so if you struggled, you were not alone for sure. Um, I would say that if, the, if you struggled, lots of people did, uh, and uh, statisticians are going to go to work, I expect, and so um, I don't think that is necessarily going to be an indication uh, that you necessarily failed. Uh, the, the number of points that are required for being delineated as proficient may change if the questions are extra hard. I don't know exactly how the statistics go into that, but that would be what I would expect. So. Um, uh, but yeah, these were tough questions, but let's get into it. Uh, put it in the chat. Let me know what you guys think of these questions. Talk to each other. I probably won't get back to the questions or, uh, in the chat too much today since it's Mother's Day, uh, but I hope to respond to those soon. So here we go. Let's get into it. All right. First of all, our first question, we have a, uh, a company that has a patent on a new carbon capture technology and that uh, they're the only producer that can make it. Uh, so that means they've got a monopoly, essentially. Their firm is earning positive economic profit and they're producing the profit maximizing level of output. We're gonna draw that monopoly graph, label the quantity the firm's producing, the price charged, and shade the area of consumer surplus. There's my answer right there. Downward slope in demand, marginal revenue below demand, MR equals MC quantity, priced all the way up to the demand curve there, and then that triangle above the price until you hit the demand curve is our consumer surplus. There you go. All right, for the next part, we're going to uh, suppose that the government is going to consider taxing the firm, right? Remember that uh, monopolies underproduce and overcharge, so they're going to, uh, so the question is, could putting a per unit tax change the firm's output to the socially optimal quantity and explain. So remember monopolies already underproduce. And if we put a tax, that's just gonna make things worse, right? So a per unit tax would just make things worse. So no, because a per unit tax would shift the marginal cost upward, which would decrease the quantity produced and make it farther from the socially optimal quantity. And it would actually increase deadweight loss as a result. All right, on to the next part of B. Instead, uh, suppose the government imposes a price ceiling so that the firm produces the socially optimal quantity. We're going to label that price ceiling PC and the quantity that would be produced as QC. So uh, socially optimal is where the price equals the marginal cost or where the demand curve intersects that marginal cost curve. So there it is there at QC and the price there is PC. All right. On to the next part, at the price that we just identified is the firm earning positive economic profit. Explain. Uh, this one's gonna depend on how you drew it, but uh, as you can see on the way I drew it, at that uh, PC price, at the quantity of QC, uh, the average total cost curve is a little below that price. So my answer here is yes, because the price is greater than the average total cost at that quantity of QC. All right, I do think that depending on how you drew the graph, there's a chance you could get the point uh, by saying the other way, right? Because it'll be consistent based on the graph, I expect, All right? Next for C, uh, if the firm is now uh, going to increase its uh, output by one unit, would marginal revenue, oh, excuse me, so assume that, <laughs> we gotta back up for a second, assume that the government decides not to regulate the firm, and instead the firm produces the quantity of output that maximizes total revenue. Now maximizing total revenue means that they are producing where marginal revenue is zero. So back on the graph we just saw, it's where that marginal revenue curve intersects the quantity axis. That is where the, pro the uh, total revenue maximizing quantity would be. So the question is asking if they increased output by one more unit from that point, would marginal revenue be positive, negative, or zero? Explain. And so there's my answer here, negative. And the reason why is because maximizing total revenue is where marginal revenue is zero. And the next unit has a marginal revenue below the axis. So it's negative, right? That would be the inelastic range of the demand curve that's above, right? So total revenue actually starts to fall at that point as they produce more units of output. For the next part, we're going to start uh, starting at the total revenue maximizing quantity. If the firm reduces the price by 10%, would the quantity demanded increase by less than 
more than 10% or exactly by 10%. Here, once again, they are now going to be in the inelastic range of the demand curve because marginal revenue is now negative. And so I would say that, there you go, less than. So, right, uh, that gives us a coefficient that is has an absolute value less than one. So it'd be inelastic. All right, on to the next question for number two. Uh, here we have a strange looking graph. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what happened. It looks like a formatting error to me where the quantity axis didn't get drawn all the way. Hopefully that didn't trip anybody up. Uh, but we have uh, Bueno, it's a firm that produces and sells guava and it's a type of fruit and it's perfectly competitive and we've got our graph here. So what we see here, uh, first of all, is a market failure and we have to identify that market failure. As you can see, we have two marginal benefit curves. We have the marginal private benefit and a marginal social benefit that is greater than the marginal social benefit. Since it's on the demand curve or downward sloping side, this is a positive externality in consumption. Uh, I don't know if they're going to require you to say in consumption. I hope not. So they have not required those sorts of distinctions in the past, uh, but we'll see what they do. We'll see. All right. Uh, using numbers from the graph, we're going to um, identify that amount of external benefit. Um, I like to take the external benefit at the market quantity, which would be uh, Q0 here. So I'm going to go with 8 minus 5 equals $3. Um, these are parallel lines, so it's the same amount the whole way through. I, um, if you showed your math and you said 7 minus 4, I expect they're going to give it to you as well there. Uh, but we'll see what happens. All right. Uh, for C, assume that the market is in short run equilibrium and this firm is going to, uh, actually the firm of Bueno hires workers in a perfectly competitive market. Uh, the wage is $20 an hour. That means that's the marginal resource cost here, essentially. And the marginal product of the last worker hired was six units. We're going to calculate the change in the profit. So as we can see there, the uh, market price is going to be $5 there, right? So, uh, and then six units, I put $6, but that should be six units of output. And uh, multiply those together, together gives us $30 worth of marginal revenue product. Uh, and, that, and so we take the $30 worth of marginal revenue product, subtract the price of that worker or the wage, which is $20, and that gives us a change in profit of $10. And I don't think I'd get marked wrong by accidentally having a dollar sign next to the six. I'm pretty sure that'd be just fine. So I'm gonna go ahead and leave it, all right? All right, on to the next part. Suppose that the government decides to uh, provide a per unit subsidy to consumers who buy guava. How would that per unit subsidy affect the uh, Bueno's marginal revenue product curve and explain? So it's going to increase that marginal revenue product curve or shift it to the right. And that's because the subsidy would actually increase demand for the Price for the product, right? Um, and therefore, increase the price of guavas, right? And remember, marginal revenue product is the marginal product, which wouldn't change for the workers that are being hired. Uh, but we are now multiplying by a larger price of guavas here as a result of the demand curve shifting to the right, all right? That would give us a higher price. On to the next one. Instead of hiring workers in a perfectly competitive market, uh, Bueno hires workers in a monopsony. So uh, will the number of workers increase, decrease, or stay the same and explain? Remember a monopsonistic labor market, uh, you have the monopsony is going to under hire and under pay. So uh, they're going to decrease the quantity hired and that's because a monopsony hires a lower quantity where the MRP equals the MRC than in a perfectly competitive market. So I think that'll be enough for the explanation. All right, moving on to the next one. The last question for set one. Uh, this is a tricky one. There's all kinds of numbers here. Uh, this is actually testing whether or not you understand that a market demand curve comes from individual people's demand curves within a market. So we have a whole bunch of individual people's demand curves and we're going to add them all up to get the market demand curve, right? So, uh, First question we have to answer is, uh, we're first going to assume that the market has a perfectly elastic supply curve. We're gonna draw the market for the local market for good X with an equilibrium price of $5. Uh, we're gonna label that equilibrium price and label the equilibrium market quantity. So if we see at $5, if you look that there, there at $5, Emily will demand three, Wu will demand two, Omar will demand two, and uh, Fernanda will, demand one. So add those all together. That's eight 
is our equilibrium quantity there or that's our quantity demanded there and so since we have a perfectly elastic supply curve that ends up being our equilibrium right uh, so at five dollars we've got a quantity of eight and i think that's what they're going to be looking for there over for b we're going to assume that production increases uh oh actually uh let me rephrase that <laughs> we're going to for part b we're going to assume the cost of production increases which causes the price of good x to increase from five to seven dollars we're going to calculate the price elasticity of demand for good x uh, if the price increases from five to seven and then we're going to show our work so as you can see i have it marked there as far as the quantities demanded in the market we're at eight dollar or eight units of output at five dollars and we're going to have uh, four units of output at four dollars uh, and so we're going to calculate our percentage change of quantity remember quantity is always on top divided by the percentage change of price to calculate the percentage change, my preferred method and the preferred method on the AP exam is new minus old divided by old times 100. So let's go ahead and do that. We have four minus eight divided by eight times 100 gives us a percentage change of quantity of negative 50%. And then the percentage change in price is seven minus five divided by five times 100 gives us a percentage change of price of 40%. So negative 50% divided by 40% gives us a coefficient, an elasticity coefficient of negative 1.25. I don't think you will be required to have that negative there. I believe absolute value will be just fine. But since that absolute value is greater than one, for the next part, we have to identify if this good has elastic, inelastic, or unit elastic demand, price elasticity of demand in that range of prices. And since we had 1.25 as our absolute value, that is greater than one, it's elastic. All right, and again, that'll be consistent. That You could get a consistency point based on whatever you calculated, I believe. On to C. So could Emily's marginal benefit for the second unit of good X equal $4.50? Explain. Well, if you look, Emily actually is willing to pay as much as $7 for two units of output. So that means that two units of output or that second unit is worth between six and eight dollars for her. Otherwise, she wouldn't be willing to pay that much. So I put no because Emily is willing to pay seven dollars for the second unit. And she could actually be willing to pay as, as much as uh, seven dollars and ninety nine cents. We don't know exactly where where her cutoff exactly is. All right, so that means her marginal benefit of that second unit is at least seven dollars. It's also less than eight, by the way. All right. So there you go. That's my answer for that one. All right, and there you have it. That's that's it. My, uh, those are my answers for uh, set one. Check out the set two video if you didn't have any of those questions. If you also didn't have the set two questions, then you probably had a version of the exam that isn't going to be released. And unfortunately, you'll never get to see those questions or talk about them, most likely. All right. Um, thank you very much for watching this year. Tell your friends about ReviewWeekOn.com. And uh, uh, best of luck to you guys in the future. All right, take care.